Welcome to another episode of Relentlessly Resilient, where real people share real life experiences and the tools they've developed to move forward and live their best life. I'm Michelle Scharf. And I'm Jenny Taylor. And today we are with Beth McDonald. Beth, how are you this morning? I'm doing really well. Thank you for asking. Uh, We are so glad to have you. For our listeners who might have listened this time last year around Memorial Day, every year we partner with a wonderful nonprofit organization called The Unquiet Professional. And it's a group that honors uh, military members, fallen military members, and their families. And each year, they select a couple of just incredible families and uh, military members to honor. And this year, we're excited to do the same with Beth. We are grateful to have you here and tell us your story, your family's story, and, of course, the story of your husband, uh, Master Sergeant Gregory Trent of the Army Green Beret Group. So just anytime I do anything with anyone with the Green Berets, my... I'm just so impressed. All of you from the service member to the family supporting them. What an incredible community. Thank you for your service and sacrifice. And thank you for joining us today. We're really excited to honor you and the Unquiet Professional with this celebration as we get near Memorial Day. Thank you so much. So we want to just get to know you first. Beth, tell us, who are you? Who's your husband? How did you meet? Give us a little background. Let us get to know you a bit. Um, Who am I? I am... (laughs) I don't know what to say about myself. I met Greg in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, which is my hometown. And uh, we met 22 years ago on Memorial Day weekend. He was on leave. He was a pass for the weekend. And uh, a pass is just, you know, when they let you go away for like four days and they don't count it against your vacation time in the Army. And he was with a buddy of his. And uh, me and my best girlfriend were out and about. And uh, I saw this really cute guy. And I was like, wow, he's adorable. Oh, I like him. Oh, oh, take him. <laughs> so uh, we went out dancing later that day, and uh, that was that was it. Uh, he was the one. So he was living at Fort Bragg. He was stationed here. I stayed in Pennsylvania for a while, and then uh, we got married, and I moved down to Fort Bragg. And uh, he just, he was my whole world. He was just everything. He was worth leaving everything behind for. And uh, he was a paratrooper. He was in the artillery and then we got stationed in Vicenza, Italy, and had our daughter, Gwyneth. And then the war in Iraq kicked off. So the pace picked up a little bit with war, and we got to see each other a little less. But he had decided he wanted to be a Green Beret and progress his career because he was really exceptional. And the, the Green Berets are the quiet professionals. And if there was really a great word for my husband, it was quiet. <laughs> so he was extremely good at what he did and was very well respected. He was such a good leader and it was a, it was a great fit for him. The The regiment was a great fit for him. So I supported him because that's what he wanted to do. And, you know, my focus was on our family. As long as I had our family, I was good. Like I'll, I'll, I was going to go wherever he was going to go. And I would be happy wherever I could fit in wherever, a little bit of a chameleon. Um, and, <laughs> Which is know, a good a thing job. for a military spouse to be because some are not so and it can be really difficult to move around and have to start over again and again. So that sounds like you're a good fit for that. Yeah. And, you know, it, it was important not to build resentments with that, too, because a, a lot of military spouses or spouses in general, men and women, can build resentments if they feel like they're left behind. and we had that sense of this is our family and we're just, we're going to agree on things. We're going to have talks about things and we're going to move forward in the direction that's best for our family. Um, I love that. So I found my career wherever his was and and I was okay with that. I was, I was flexible. You got to bend like the willow sometimes. I just want to ask you something. So a lot of people that we've interviewed on this podcast over the past year or so that have military service have joined because of 9-11. And that moment was kind of a defining motivator to go sign up and join the army or the Navy or what have you. But your husband joined in 1998. You met him in the year 2000. This is when we lived in a very different world. Mm -hmm. Pre 9-11 is almost impossible to remember. I can barely remember pre pandemic, but can you tell us a little bit about his choice, what you know of his choice to serve even before he met you? And then maybe kind of your initial take on, you just fell in love with a soldier. Was that a, did you have a military background? Did you see yourself being a soldier? wife what was that kind of initial holy cow this might change my world even without a war at the time so he joined because he wanted to see the world and pay off his student loans he 
he was just <laughs> fabulous like, motivation. You know <laughs> yeah. He had gotten an associate's degree from Fisher College and he started off at Dartmouth. Trent. Okay. I, I usually call him Trent. So when I go back and forth between Greg and Trent, I say Greg because it's his first name. Everybody's familiar with Greg, but to oh. me, he was Trent. Okay. Um, so he started off at Dartmouth in Massachusetts. He was brilliant, but he couldn't afford it. He couldn't keep affording to go there. So he transferred to Fisher, got his associate's degree, and then he couldn't, couldn't pay his tuition off and joined the Army, wanted to see the world. And he wasn't much of a fighter. He was a very calm, logical, wise man. And just, he wasn't passive, but he was wise. So, yeah. you know, he went to work as he was told to, and he he fought because he was told to. He was good at it, but he never, that's not how he started things. So, you know, he was patriotic like anybody else would be, but not overly so. Sure. Just an average dude, except he was really brilliant. And I really loved that about him. But he never made anybody feel stupid with his brilliance. Like, he would never talk down to anybody. It was really amazing to that's watch him. a gift, him. Yeah. In a crowd, yeah, yeah, he was really cool. So my father was in the Navy, so I had military background, but I never thought in a million years, you know, we didn't live near an Army post or a Navy sure. base per se, so I never thought, you know, like, oh, hey, yeah, Army life, that's for me. I just knew that when I met him, I was like, well, this is the one. And when <laughs> I'll I got take married, him wherever like, he is. Yeah, yeah, I'll take one of those, please. And <laughs> it's like, just, that's how we went. So I never thought anything about it. And then when 9-11 happened, I thought, oh, well, this is going to throw a kink in things. But, yeah. oh, well, you know, what do you do? It's just, sure. So I didn't really think about it. And then war, and it was like, oh, well, okay. And I was working for the Department of Defense at the time. So it was just another day. So, oh, great. Now it's war. Fantastic. So well, I just go with the flow with a lot of things. So, um, like you are, you're kind of the dreamy. <laughs> You're the dreamy army wife. I mean, honestly, because like you said, even outside of the military, it can be difficult to support a spouse's career that can be as demanding and, and, and maybe you've got to relocate or you might be gone for a while. Can you tell us about Trent's deployments, his service? You were all in Italy. And then, of course, the war in Iraq started, and it sounds like he then went to yeah, the Middle Yeah, I want to know East. where they yeah. were tell when 9-11 where, where he... happened. Oh, that'd be good. Yeah. When 9-11 happened... Trent was on Fort Bragg. I was working in Irwin, North Carolina, which is 45 minutes from where we lived. It was the only place I could find a job. And I was working in hospital administration. And uh, it was a good little job. And I was in the surgery department. And, you know, all the phones were, were clogged up right after it happened. And I was watching it happen like, oh, that's not good. And I finally heard from Trent probably about 6 o'clock that night. And he's like, oh, I'm going to be stuck on base for a while. And I was like, oh, I'll see you when I see you. And so as the days went on, you know, we were unsure if he was going to deploy quickly or not. And he ended up not deploying quickly, but not deploying at all to Afghanistan. But then in 2003, we had moved to Italy in 2001. And then he had deployed to Iraq and opened up the Northern Front with the 173rd. Wow. So, and that was, you know, we were, I was working for uh, CTAC or the Southern European task force at that point, again, with the Department of Defense. So we were tracking the plans for the deployment at our level up there. But, you know, the guys were in a box and they were they were in a place where they couldn't communicate before deployment. So they could deploy under clouded secrecy. So we were just, you know, not communicating when he went to Iraq and waiting to see how long he would be deployed to Iraq. And initially, they thought it was going to be three months, and then it ended up being a year. But again, you know, it's one of those things where it depended on the requirements of the mission. Sure, especially so, so early on. You know, um, you're right at the very beginning. That is the beginning of the war in Iraq. Like you said, he's opening it up. You're the first there. There's not really a lot of predictability in many deployments, but especially so, not one like that. Is he a Green Beret yeah. at this point? No, he was with the artillery battery at this point, and he wanted to be a Green Beret. And he was looking at his options. And I was looking into what that meant for us as a family. And because the Green Berets have better resources and those better resources lead to better statistics for recovery from 
war wounds and casualties and things like that, I was all for it. I was like, well, go ahead. That's, you know, Interesting. that makes our, our chances some, better. Yeah, where some might be scared to death of such an elite, you know, seemingly dangerous group, but to, for you to look at it as the resources available being a, a plus, that's that's awesome. I love that perspective. Well, yeah, I, just, I think it makes sense because you have better training, you have better resources, you have better access, to, quicker access to medical care because you yeah. have a delta of medic by your side sure. all the time. A so, higher threshold you know, just, of everyone you're serving with. Exactly. I, I just thought that's a really it was, good point. Like, if you're going to go into battle, go in and go with be those as guys. prepared <laughs> as you possibly can be. Yeah. <laughs> Why wouldn't you want to go with those guys? Yeah. If you give me a, a if you give me a car to drive down a, a highway, I'm going to take the better car. That so, how long point. was that process from him being like in 9/11 and the artillery battery? What was that process until he became a Green Beret? Uh, he went for selection, and that was. You know, you'll get me to lie in if I start making up stuff. <laughs> we won't even know the difference, so that's great. Most of us have no idea what selection for Green Beret even looks like. So you could give us the super basic 101, and we'd believe yeah. you. <laughs> just give selection us the highlight was, reel. <laughs> selection was just this process where he went and did the quick and dirty, are you okay enough to go through the qualifications course? He was like, yeah, they're like, okay, you've got all your body parts, your brain's working, and you're smart enough, we'll put you through the qualification course. So then he went through the qualification course where he had to learn a language, learn a specialty, do all this stuff. And the qualification course, I want to say, was about a year. And then at the very end, they test you to see if you learn everything and can apply it. And he did, and, and he graduated at the top of his class, which didn't surprise me at all. And I'm probably a terrible wife because I don't think I congratulated him. I was like, well, of course you did. So (laughs) he he graduated at the top of his class and um, became a Green Beret and was super proud of himself. And the whole time I was like, well, I expected this outcome. This is making this is making me laugh because a minute ago I wrote down something you said. You're describing your husband, <clears throat> that he wasn't like a fighter by nature, that he was just quiet and a good guy and overall a great leader. And then you said, except he was really brilliant. Like he was just kind of normal, except he was really brilliant, which it sounds like you just knew that and expected him to be and, and might not have been surprised when the guy graduated top of his class because he yeah. was really brilliant. He, yeah, he was capable of all this stuff. So, you know, like failure wasn't an option and it wasn't even a certainty. In my life, it's a certainty. It's like, I'm going to, I'm going to screw something up <laughs> it's today. It's just a matter of what. <laughs> it's I just love a matter it. of what. But it was Trent, like he would just look at something and he'd be like, this is what I'm going to do. And then he would do it. And I'd be like, oh. Of course okay, you so did that done. well. Yeah. So yeah. once he was a Green Beret, did you guys stay at Fort Bragg? Did he deploy again? What What happens next once he's in the Green Beret group? He's in the Green Berets. He's got his little greenie beanie, and he's in third group, and he deploys, and not right away. First, he gets made fun of for not having deployed with the Green Berets, which oh, really annoyed him because he had a lot he's of outsider. deployment time. <laughs> yes, he's the outsider. He doesn't have an SF deployment, uh, which is a thing. And, and to me, I'm like, man, it'll be fine. I don't have a male ego, so I don't understand these yeah. things. But he was so excited for his first deployment. And I was like, well, go have fun. Yeah. You know? And so he comes back and, uh, you know, now he can put his shiny patch on and walk around and, you know, puff out his lats and, you know, all that manly stuff. So, yeah, he, he had deployed quite a few times and changed his MOS. He went from, it was an 18 Echo, which means he was a communication sergeant. So he did all this electronic communication satellite stuff. And okay. it makes no sense to me, but it makes all kinds of sense in the military world when it comes to that stuff. I don't know what it is. Yeah. So he changed his MOS so he could be like a spy. And that's not the right term. And somebody's going to listen to this and go, why would you say that? That's not what the MOS is. To me, that's what it is. He was Got a spy. It. But it, he, went, he went to this James Bond school in England, and he loved it. And he went and bought the James Bond watch, and he was so proud of that. Then he progressed and eventually became the Zulu, which is the team sergeant. So he was doing really well and, and progressed in his career just as he wanted to and followed, like checked all his blocks. He was doing great. That's awesome. All right, Beth, we're going to take a quick minute. When we come back, we want you to tell us what happens now that he is this Zulu, this leader, this intelligence guy headed back to war. We'll be right back.
All right, Beth, we're back. Tell us about this exceptionally brilliant husband of yours who's now the team sergeant. He's a Zulu. I love James Bond school. I'm laughing because my husband's original military assignment, his MOS, was military intelligence. And I would say the same thing. He's like a spy. I don't really know what he does, but it's it's intelligence stuff. But my husband didn't yeah. get to go to James Bond school. I promise he would have loved it. So <laughs> yeah, tell it us. Sounds, I'm a big James cool. Bond yeah. fan. I'm like, ooh. This, this could be awesome. Is there really a school in England? I didn't yeah. know about that. Really? Yeah. It's not called the James Bond school, though. No, absolutely <laughs> But that's pretty much what it is. Like, yeah, and, and there's somebody out there that's going to listen. Like, my boss is going to listen to this, and he's going to be like, Beth, what on earth are you talking about? But hey, for, the, for the everyday reader, you've helped us understand it. We know what James Bond school might be. Like, that has a place in my head. Yeah. So tell us, Beth, what happens on this, this next deployment and um, the reason that we've got you here honoring you as we approach Memorial Day as a Gold Star Widow. So he gets us a, a lot of shenanigans, we'll say, on this next, this final deployment. This was his seventh deployment total. And, uh, seven. The you said seven. One. Okay. Seven. Yeah, okay. seven. The big seven. I think five were recognized by uh, the Army uh, because of the level of secret squirrel stuff that he did. And there were so many things that he did that I didn't know about. I didn't have that level of clearance. So. Sure. He gets into all these firefights and all this stuff. And the final one, he was shot in the head. And it was a catastrophic injury. And because he worked, because I worked for a unit in USASAC as well, the United States Army Special Operations Command, because I worked in one of those units as well, he, the unit that he, third group, thought I might have seen the list of casualties the day that he got shot. Oh, my goodness. And they thought I might have found out from another source that my husband was a casualty. And they didn't know early on in every deployment, everybody that I worked with, I was like, don't tell me if you see something. Let the casualty process work. Right. We know there's, we have talked about that on our show before, that there's the protocol when there is a, a death in the military that... Yeah. So it sounds like you, but you, because of your employment with the Special Operations Command for the Army, there's a chance you could have seen a name of lists and recognized one of those names, but it sounds like you didn't. No, and and I didn't, the last thing I wanted to do was go into work one day Open and then an get email. stuck there, paralyzed, yeah. because yeah. I saw my husband's name. And I loved the people I worked with, great group of humans, but I didn't want to have to sit there with them. No. And then try to figure out what my next move was. So, so what did happen? It, it, well, it was a funny story. I wasn't at work, and I, I wasn't at home, really. My daughter slammed her finger in a car door, and I was taking her to school, and she almost broke her thumb. Oh. And in that moment where you're thinking, am I a good mom or am I a bad mom? What do <laughs> I do here? Because it's not a serious injury, yeah. but it's badly bruised. If I take her to school, they're going to call me a bad mom <laughs> for letting her go to school like this. But if I take her to the emergency room, they're going to think I'm overreacting. Right. She's it's just got a bruise. Broken. Sure. Right. So I took her to the emergency room anyway, and I took her in, got the whole thing done and over with in about three hours. I take her home. But before I took her home, we were getting ready for trying to come home from that deployment in the next several weeks. So at the end of each deployment, I started racking up more food. I lived like a bachelor while he was gone. And while our daughter was young, the only thing she ate were ramen noodles and probably Lucky Charms. I hey, know, girl, I hear you. I've, I've lived through a lot of bachelor deployments with my own little kids. I get it. I totally get it. Yeah. So, you know, I we stopped at the commissary and picked up a bunch of junk food, but it looked like... All I could think of when I got notified was that it looked like I had a binge bag in my front oh. hallway because they called me. They couldn't find me, and they had to do the door knock. Sure. And so I get this call, and it's not clicking because the protocol is they knock on your door if it's very seriously injured or or deceased, and they give you a phone call if your soldier's ambulatory. Right. So I'm getting this phone call, and it's somebody I know, it's the rear detachment commander, is a friend of ours, and he's just, he can't quite get it out, and I'm just like, why are you stuttering, Ben? I'm not being the friendliest person I could be, because I'm kind of making fun of him, Yeah, thinking he's calling, he's not, 
He's like, we have to come over and we need to know where you are. And so I'm like, well, duh, I'm at home, not thinking. And, you know, so yeah. it's like the whole thing's not clicking in my head. Right. And then it, and then I hear him crying and I was like, oh gosh. Oh no. Like it start. I'm like, is he going to be okay? And Ben said, no, Beth, I'm so sorry. He's not going to make it. Oh my god! And then I was like, oh, oh no. So, and my daughter's standing there the whole time. And I, I didn't even How recognize old? that. How old was your daughter? She was eight. Oh. And incredibly intuitive, intelligent young lady. And so I hung up the phone and I'm holding on to the kitchen counter. And the floor is just not beneath my feet at this point. And yeah. Gwen looks at me and she goes, mom, is daddy going to die? And I was like, Oh, why is today good mom, bad mom day? Yeah. Cause it just I escalated know, really quickly. Yeah. I'm like, but if I lie to you now, well, there goes our trust. And if I tell you the truth, you can't really comprehend. And I don't know what the truth is right? because I don't have details. So I'm like, I don't know. I don't know what's going on with your dad. And she's like, well, are we going to be okay? And I'm like, oh, we'll be fine. I'm like, oh, I don't know how. Heart. Eventually this, Yes, because my Nana always used to say, this too shall pass, like a kidney stone, maybe, but it's kind of, like, we'll get there. <laughs> but it just, uh. I have no idea how this is going to go, but we'll figure it out 15 minutes at a time. So and tell us, so, they came, what does that next hour look like, the next day, the next week or two look like in that casualty notification process? So I had talked with my girlfriends prior to this, because, you know, the guys, they plan for war. They plan for casualties. And I believe as spouses, we should too. So my closest girlfriends and I had talked about what was going to happen if one of us were notified. And so I called my three closest girlfriends. One of them would stick with Gwen the whole time. One of them would stick with me, take notes, be my extra set of ears. And one of them would be the bulldog in the corner that would just chase people away that weren't relevant to the situation. Because oh my as you gosh, know, you are brilliant. Breathing. Absolutely brilliant what? foresight to be able to have that plan in place. Unbelievable. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. What, you know, when you're grieving, there's the center dot of everybody who's relevant to that grief. And that's only a very few people that are affected directly. And then yeah. as you ripple out, there are all the people that want to be involved. So we had somebody to chase all those people away. So when they finally got to my house, it felt like a million years, and I was pacing on the front porch, and I had already made my welcome home wreath for Trent, and I thought about tossing it, oh my gosh. and I just looked at it, and I was like, useless. And so everybody, I had about six people come to my notification, and I had inappropriate thoughts this whole time. Like, they're all getting out of the car. I'm like, is it a clown car? Like, what's happening right now? And so people are piling out, and one of the guys was like, because they were familiar with me and I'm not the most genteel lady always. So one of them said, where's the bar? And I was like, it's in the pantry. And the chaplain immediately was like, I, I'm going to have to leave because this place is not like, because immediately I was like, somebody gives me details. I, I need to know what's going on and don't give me the standard army. You'll find out when you find out. Yeah. Um, so it, it was, a little bit uncomfortable for, I think more for the soldiers because they were ringing their green berets and they wouldn't sit down. And I was like, somebody tell me what's happening. And I knew he was shot in the head, but I didn't know where I'm like, was he shot in the jaw? Maybe like, is he going to be okay? Like, or is this a catastrophic injury? And it took me two days to find out the details of the injury. So so what did they the tell you in I, that moment? They're standing in your house. Somebody went and got a drink. And who's, yeah. who's drinking? <laughs> the chaplain? The, the, <laughs> or the you? The surgeon was drinking. The surgeon was drinking. And nobody had any details. They just knew that he was shot in the head. And that was it. And I was like, where in the head, though? And there are places where you can get a headshot and survive. Okay. I'm trying to figure well, this out. Well, and it could be a grazed like, or yeah. it could be maybe Exactly. Not so I'm like, if I draw fatal. a diagram, could you point to the place on the face where the bullet may have been? And nobody could answer it. And they're all in tears. And I'm like, I don't have time for tears. I have to know what's going on with my yeah, husband. That would like, drive me insane. Me. Yeah. So what details and, did you get? 
Just that he'd Nothing been... for two days. Wow. Nothing okay, so two days. two days later, what are the details that you get? It was a catastrophic injury, and it was a graze wound, but the ricochet blew out so much of his brain, his sinus cavity, the frontal lobe, uh, everything that makes you a person that he wasn't going to ever recover. It was catastrophic. So wow. I, I was blessed enough to talk to the head of neurology at Launch Soul when he had gotten there, when Trent had gotten there. And so he, he read to me the So these two days, so he's I, not actually dead. He's just no, catastrophically no. injured. Yes, he was in a coma for about eight or nine days okay. before he passed. Oh, my and goodness. So his medic had intubated him when he hit the ground. And so he, he survived and he had several craniotomies, uh, a couple of heart attacks. He was stroking. He was actively dying the entire time. And two days after the injury, his neurosurgeon read me the entire report from battlefield to that point. Are they getting days. you to him? Where is he at? Germany? He was in launch store. Yeah. They were trying to get us to him and they were also transferring him to Walter Reed. So as he's doing this, I called it, you know, the rainbow tour. I was thinking of Vita going through the rainbow tour of hospitals through Afghanistan and Germany and, and America. We had missed him on the way to launch soul. Our flight got canceled as he was wheeled up on the way to Walter Reed. So we drove straight from Walter Reed from home rather than trying to, to get extend to Germany just to get to him. Yeah. yeah. And so at that point, like I, I knew what we had to do and he had a living will and we had prepared for this. Every time he deployed, we went through, you know, if, if you lose an arm, what are we going to do? If you lose two legs, what are we going to do? You know, and he had the disposition of remains filled out. He had every single piece of paper that you could imagine prepared for this. And our passports were updated. So we were well prepared paperwork wise, but still, you know, it, you're never prepared no, for the actual. Really no, no, absolutely not. Yeah. So you just we, prepare we in advance so that you have some peace that you've made some good decisions once it, if, <laughs> if it ever happens, right? Not yeah, that you plan yeah, you on know. it happening, but. That, right, because you ha you know he made those decisions yeah. and you didn't have to. You've had those conversations. And also, you're allowed to grieve and not have to look for paperwork. Right. Everything's so, already ready. He gets to Walter Reed. What day is that? Day five, six? Oh, I, it, uh, I have no idea. Okay. I really don't Do you, remember did you how see many him? Days. That was my question. Did, did you make it to him alive? I made it to him as he was getting off of the bus that they took him from the airplane to the hospital with. So I got there at the same time he did. Okay. And I was there for his final roll call. And the guys around... What does that mean, him, final roll call? They do roll call for every person getting off of that ambulance, which is a giant bus because of all of the, the equipment that they come with. And some people are ambulatory and can you know, announce themselves, but roll call, he couldn't, Trent could do for himself. He was in a coma and he was hooked up to a lot of machines, did the roll call for him because they do the roll call during the memorial ceremony, but it's not the same. So they did roll call and I was there for that. And all the people around the bus were like, man, you don't want to see this. And I was like, this is my husband. He couldn't have a man cold and not think it was the bird flu or the swine flu or think he was dying from a cold. He actually has a bullet wound in his head. Wow. I'm going to be here. Yeah. Like, I, you know, so I held his hand from the ambulance up to the hospital room. And, you know, and Trent loved all the Griswold stuff. So the first thing I thought, too, when I saw his head was, well, your, your hair ain't never going to part right again. Like, and <laughs> I was trying to fix this part because that's like everything. Everything in my head was either like Monty Python or Griswold, and I was just trying to smooth his hair out. That's funny that that's your like coping mechanism it, is kind of that humor. Is he yeah. his so, head bandaged? I mean, it sounds like he's missing everything. Part he was he was missing so many parts. It was like if Mr. Potato Head 
got shook up in an airplane, and then they tried to put him back together upside down and half cover him with a blanket. That was my poor husband when he got off uh, this ambulance. Uh. And that was <laughs> my girlfriend that was with me was straightening out his blanket. She, and she had never met him before. We had been in the same SF circles for years. And we never met each other's husbands because they were always deployed. Sure. So the first yeah, time they're I met never husband, both home. I didn't want to see yeah. Never, never. So the first thing she saw when she met him was, you know, something that she wasn't intended to see. And she covered it up and she was like, well, that was not expected. Yeah. So the whole thing was just this comedy of errors. It was, it was more than a Greek tragedy. So we're going through this process. Like, of course. So what happens you know? when you get. So, when he gets into a hospital room, and t- does your daughter come and do, do you let your daughter come see him? Do you? We had a conversation about that with the social work service team. We tried to be careful about everything because we didn't want to traumatize Glenn. And Trent didn't look anything like he had looked previously. Um, with the kind of catastrophic brain injury he had, his intracranial pressure was 34. And it's normally four. So his nothing looked the same. And I didn't want her to remember the father that way. But when Trent and I had talked about it, when he was, before he deployed, he wanted us at his bedside. And I'm sitting here thinking, you know, I'm going to make a command decision. I'm going to say, no, I don't want her to see you. But there are so many things that come into play because you think beyond hope, like if you're going to survive, If Gwen is in this room, that's the only way we're going to know you're going to survive. Something will change. If you're going to survive and Gwen comes into this room, that's the moment we're going to know you're going to survive. And, you know, you have these ridiculous thoughts, you know, like despite all the tests, if you're going to be that story that ends up on ABC News. Yeah, maybe there's a chance. Sure. Right. If there's a chance. But again, I don't want to expose her to this because that's trauma for her. And Death is not beautiful like it was when McSteamy died on Grey's Anatomy. You know, this is the ugliest thing you could possibly see. And it's just not, it's not what you want for your child. So we talked to social work services and his mom had a great idea, actually. She said, why don't we take a picture and show the picture to Gwen and see if Gwen wants to say goodbye and she said, but we'll take pictures and we'll all be smiling in the picture. And I thought that was a pretty good idea, actually. So, and, you know, maybe it wasn't, but in the moment, and I, to this day, I stand by it. I still think it was a good idea because Gwen had something else to see around the picture. So we did that. We showed Gwen the picture and we, we let Gwen make the decision and the social worker supported that. So Gwen said, I will go in and I will say goodbye. So she did. She did that. And. She did as much as she was comfortable with. We didn't press her to do much more than the only thing he wasn't hooked up to was his thumb. His thumb was the only thing that wasn't hooked up to a machine. So she touched his thumb and she said, I love you, dad. And she walked outside and she said, I'm going to throw up and then I'm going to go take a nap. And I thought if any part of you is from New Jersey, it's that part right there. Like I was born in Jersey and like anything. Look at that girl. She was born in she was born in Germany and all of the Jersey just came out. So I'm going to go throw up and I'm going to take a nap and then we're never going to talk about this again. <laughs> so she went into the bathroom. She came out. She goes, I didn't throw up, but I am going to go take a nap. Yeah. <laughs> and oh, she took goodness. like a three hour nap. She woke up from her nap and she said, I'd like to go shopping now because everybody was throwing gift cards at her. Like here, take this to make up for your, for your father. Right. And right. so I was like, I'm never going to be able to keep up with this pace of Barbie dolls and, my little ponies at yeah. some point. So she did go shopping. She brought some Polly Pockets, and that was the end of it. And then the next day, he had died. But she, and did he she die on his own doing? Nope. Or he was well, yes, technically he was extubated, and he had the do not resuscitate, and he had a uh, a living will. So it was a matter of you know, and because he he had had a heart attack at one point during our time at Walter Reed and he had a heart attack in calf in the Kandahar airfield hospital. And both times he recovered with the do not resuscitate. So we extubated him on the ACE. Um, he was an organ donor. So he was, so we removed all sustaining life support 
and and I held him as he died. Um, and that was that was on August eighth. Uh, Gwen was not present for that, but his parents were. I was there, um, and that's what he would have wanted. So we we did as he had asked. Oh, Beth, I this is it's heartbreaking, and yet I can't believe how. I hear your resilience and your even the humor that you can throw in very matter of fact. I mean, you've got so much to teach us. We're going to take a break and come right back. There is no way we'll finish this in one episode. So I hope you'll be willing to join us. We'll do a we'll do a part two in a bit. But let's come back from a break in one second and take it from there. All right, so Beth, we've got a few minutes left in this episode, and then I really do hope you'll be able to record with us again because there is just so much here in this story and and so much we haven't even started to talk about, and that's everything you've done since. So you've just told us about your husband's last breath, those last moments. In the last few minutes that we have together today, can you tell us maybe where your head was um, what thoughts, now that you know he is deceased, there's no last chance of hope, the machines have been unplugged, and with these last few minutes we have today, where was your head and what were you thinking in terms of what happens next? Well, keeping his legacy alive, really, because we loved each other and we had lived our lives to meet our goals, you know, and when you live in the military, you kind of treat your time Preciously, especially when you're at war. And I think we had done that. So raising Gwen to really be the person, the best person she could be, because she's his best legacy. And he loved her more than he loved me. And I'm not even ashamed to say that. I don't think he would even argue (laughs) with that statement. If he were here to argue, we contact him on a Ouija board, he'd be like, absolutely love her. 100%. Not even Um, arguing. Yeah. Yeah, Totally. You know, raise a Gwen to be a good human and just honor him the best way we can because, you know, I've got him in the back of my head a lot of times saying, you know, like, just this is little one-liners, you know, and they they keep me moving forward and it it contributes to my resiliency, but it also, it's a, it's a little bit of a moral compass because he was, he was a good dude and you know, he loved us and he would have wanted us to be happy. And so we use that to kind of motivate us forward. So that's, that's always been my motivation since he died and just, you know, grieve, give a bad day to do, get the pint of hagen play the Sarah McLaughlin music and, and then switch <laughs> to polka because polka will not upset you ever. So, you know, when it's oh, time- Beth, I, I am just <laughs> sitting here, you know, I, like I said, we've interviewed other military families. I, as a as a military survivor and spouse, I've met other military families. I don't know that I've ever talked with someone who felt so prepared, even though, like you both said, of course, you're not prepared for that day, but you, you'd thought through those things. You had a plan. You were able to execute the plan both on your side with your support group and also your husband's side in terms of do or don't, resuscitate and things. I am sitting here and awe saying, what if every military family, what if every civilian family had had some of those hard conversations before the tragic day came? What a difference it would make that your resilience didn't come because your husband died. It was there long before. I mean, Jersey girl, you've got it. And it's so, (laughs) it's impressive, but it's inspiring. And it's making me think, you know, are there some conversations maybe I need to have? And my family and and friends where we're not in the special forces community thinking my husband could die any day, but life is precious in and out of the military. And the fact that you had talked about so many of those things before, of course, it didn't take the sting out of the death or the tragedy out of this mm-hmm. loss. But to hear you say, I knew what he wanted because we talked about it. I knew what I would do because we talked about it. I knew who to call because we talked about it. That is incredible to me. And it's a resilience before you, I I mean, you're proving that you can prepare. Mm -hmm. Resilience can be prepared even though you can't predict exactly what will happen and the the path you'll have to walk. 
you can prepare. And I just thank you. I, I really look forward to another conversation with you because I know you've contributed to books about resilience. You've been involved with Harvard studies about resilience. You've pretty much proven that resilience doesn't have to come out of horrible tragedy, but it can be refined in tragedy, but also can be prepared for. It can be built. It can be strengthened. And I think that's exactly what we're hoping to learn here in the studio and all of our listeners. So if you have to narrow it down, what does resilience mean to you? Um, I think resilience is the ability to get back up, to push forward and find the balance between that bad day with the haagen and the ability to keep going and not crumble to the grief because the grief is there and, and that's undeniable. But resilience is the ability to just chase the patch of sunlight on a rainy day. Absolutely. And I love that. You know, I love that. You know, the... Sometimes I have encountered people that when I'm having a bad day will say they mean well, but it, but the intent of what they're saying is basically I should be over this by now. Yeah. My husband's been dead I thought you and a half years. I thought you were doing so well. Now you're, now you're falling apart again. Right. Yeah. yeah. And the reality is grief is something that we carry with us forever. I love my husband. I always will love my husband. That's never going to stop. And so there are moments when the grief hits me. But I love how you express it because it, it's the only way that I've learned to get through it faster is to allow myself to feel it. And yeah. so yeah. whatever that looks like for me, whether it's going to bed and crying my heart out and thinking about him and having some memories and then when it's done, it's over. And Here then I go. get out of bed and I wash my face and I get on with my day. Yeah. I love what you said. <laughs> To give a bad day its due. Yep. Don't shove and it under the rug. And sometimes it's not Don't a day. Ignore it. Yeah. The you know, of. The, the great news is, is that the more you practice it, the less time it usually takes to, to move to feel through that. it. Yeah. Yeah. Resilience is all about acceptance. Yeah. It's accepting the circumstances, accepting that it's a roller coaster, that you're going to go back to having the feels, that you're going to accept hope, you're going to accept the circumstances, you're going to accept the bad day. You're going to allow the feelings to flow because you have to process those feelings. Feelings evolve and the love is there, but it also evolves through the years and everything evolves and accepting that evolution as we age with our grief, we have to accept all of it. Yeah. And, and that's really, that's really the crux of it, I think. Yeah, I, I did too. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. Oh, my goodness, it was great to talk to you. And we will definitely figure out a time to get you on because I have no idea what she's doing. And it sounds like she's well, got it, a million things yeah, going you, on. You met your husband 20 years ago. You lost him 10 years ago. And we need we need the second part of that story or yeah. the next part. So thank you, Beth, for joining yeah, us. We'll definitely get you thank scheduled. You for me on. Yeah, we'll get you scheduled. Thank you for joining us today. If you've liked what you've heard, please subscribe for free to the podcast and uh, give us a rating and review. If you know someone who has a real story about real life that they or you are willing to share, uh, send us an email at rrpodcast at ksl.com. You can also find us on Facebook at Relentlessly Resilient or on Instagram at Relentlessly Resilient Podcast. And remember, no matter what you do today, remember to be kind. You have no idea the struggles people are going through in their lives. Have a great day, everybody.